Hi, I'm Bob Butler from KCBS Radio. Welcome to a forum to discuss Regional Measure 3, which will be on the ballot June 5th for the primary election. Today's forum is sponsored by the Contra Costa Elections Division, the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, and the League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa. We're recording these roundtables here in the studio of Contra Costa Television with some crew assistance from the city of Walnut Creek. Regional Measure 3 will appear on the ballot in each of the nine Bay Area counties. If approved by a majority of the voters, this measure will fund major roadway and public transit improvements via an increase in tolls on all Bay Area bridges except the Golden Gate Bridge. The measure would increase tolls by $1 in January of 2019, a dollar in January 2022, and one more dollar in January of 2025. The goal of the measure is to reduce traffic congestion and improve transportation options in Bay Area corridors. Some of these identified projects with the funds collected from the measure include new BART cars, the extension of BART to Silicon Valley, the widening of 101 through the Marin Sonoma Narrows to accommodate new carpool lanes, improvements to State Highway 37 serving Solano, Marin, Napa, and Sonoma counties, more frequent and expanded ferry service, improvements to 680 and State Highway 4, the interchange there, improvements to the Interstate 80, 680 State Highway 12 interchange, extension of Caltrain to downtown San Francisco, and carpools will continue to receive a 50% discount. Joining me for a discussion on Regional Measure 3 is Newell Arnrich, Mayor of the Town of Danville. He is a supporter of Measure 3. And also joining us is Jack Weir, President of the Contra Costa Taxpayers Association, who is among those against the measure. So thank you both for joining me today. And so, Mr. Mayor, why are you supporting Regional Measure 3? Well, you know, I've learned in 23 years of being in government that um, you have to have um, the desire to fix problems. And when you look back at our economy, I can remember um, driving across the San Mateo Bridge when the, the economy first turned down, and they were working on that extra lane. Well, guess what? When that lane opened up to get um, uh, four lanes in each direction, there was nobody on that bridge, and we didn't have a problem. And at that point in time in our history, because of severe economic turndown, our traffic system was working really well. But as you know, it was really false because we had just peaked about two years before that and we had congestion. The problem in California is that we always talk our, try to talk our way out of problems. And after a while, being an architect for 40 years and an urban designer and a regional planner, that you actually have to make decisions to move forward. There are only so many limited tools that are available to government to be able to make these decisions. And government is what binds us. So for me to get to my office, my professional job, I have to drive on a public road. I can't fix it myself. I can't do anything about it. So I have to rely upon the, the people that I elect and the people to make those decisions. Regional Measure 3 is the tool that is before us that gives us an ability to try to address. I'll be honest, it doesn't address everything, but that's the world we live in. We do things incrementally. And truthfully, in transportation, you know, the horizons are 25 years and things like that out. We know for the next 25 years what the needs are. We have a plan of how to fix it. I'm here to talk about the reasons that we sh should support it, because I think it's our only option that's available to us. So, Mr. Weir, the Taxpayers Association says no. Why, what's wrong with it? I don't think there's any question that uh, we need uh, improvement in our transportation system. Um, having lived in the Bay Area and worked in the Bay Area for a very long time, I have personally experienced what it's like to try to get from my home to work and back. Uh, congestion is increasing. Um, it has a terrible impact on the environment with all those cars creeping along, pumping out pollution uh, into the air. And it takes, takes time away uh, from uh, pe people being able to be with their family and, and, and those kinds of things. So I don't think there's any question but what we need major and significant improvement in our transportation system. What Regional Measure 3 is, however, it, it's really not, so in order to significantly improve transportation in the Bay Area, we need a very comprehensive plan, an actual plan. And that's not what Regional Measure 3 is. Regional Measure 3 is essentially a project list. We call it a Christmas tree list because it offers something to everybody within the nine Bay Area counties. But it's really not a plan. There aren't any measurable objectives. There, there aren't any specific time frames incorporated into this. And, and it's sponsored by an organization in whom 
we have little faith, frankly, in its ability to adequately uh, oversee uh, um, this, this kind of a, a project uh, list. And, and we're very concerned about the sponsoring organization's ability to manage the money responsibly based on its past history. So we, we talk about it's going to raise bridge tolls. Um, and my understanding is this is a $4.4, $4.5 billion uh, measure. But why should people who drive across the bridges be the only ones who pay for it? Well, I think if you look at it that, um, you know, a, a, a registration fee for a car, only people that own cars pay that fee. And the nexus to that is very simple. Um, I need a car. If I'm going to have it, I'm going to pay the taxes for that because that's who's using the roads. And it's the commuters are the ones I commute uh, once a week um, over to San Francisco area. And the fact is, is I have to use that road. So it makes sense that I'm the one that's going to pay for it because I'm creating the impact. That if I wasn't commuting and I stayed at home, I wouldn't need to pay the toll and I wouldn't. So in the tax system that we have today, we're, it, we used to kind of go broad board and tax everybody. And say, well, there's a great benefit for you. And this is sort of targeted because the system is in place. It's overstressed because people are commuting. So I think the fairness of having people who are paying for it, and when you, then the surveys say, I'm willing to pay for it if you can help address and fix the problems and get me there. So I think that there's a clear nexus for that. So this appears to spend the majority of the money, um, or at least a good portion of the money, in Silicon Valley, you know, one of the richest areas in the country. You know, half a billion dollars goes, to, uh, goes for BART to San Jose. So is it fair for drivers to be paying for BART to San Jose when they live in, like, San Francisco or San Mateo counties or Alameda County or Contra Costa County? Well, I'll tell you a little secret. Do you know why when you put on a survey, when you ask people if they'll support expanding BART, it always is number one. Why? Because people who don't write it say, if I can get my friend on BART, I'll have more space on the freeway. And that's simply true. Um, the reality is in Contra Costa County, many of us, um, particularly Danville, South County, there's no BART there. And we've been paying on that since uh, the late 1950s. The fact is, is that is a regional system. And so in this case, we're down to the last increments to link these together. But, but you have to think about that the, the, the breakup of the money and how it's allocated, it's real projects. So in Contra Costa County, there's about $700 million. And it's proportional to what we, as those drivers, are paying. So our return to source for that is 18. The projects that we have on the list did not have the funding sources that will help improve traffic. But secondly, why should there be monies going to San Francisco and particularly to Silicon Valley? They wouldn't have a problem if we weren't driving there. So when you think about it, somebody says, well, they're not paying for it, but we created the problem by going there. So in all fairness, if in order for me to drive to Silicon Valley, if that's where my job is, I have to be able, once I get there, I have to be able to get through those streets to get to that job. So the money in, in a real clear nexus is allocated to help that situation. Because if we weren't driving, they wouldn't have a traffic problem. Mr. Weir, that sounds like a logical argument. The, uh, the, there are two main problems here. N number one, the sole source of revenue for these billions of dollars in projects is those folks who have to cross the state-owned bridges in the Bay Area. And typically, it's people getting from home to work and back. 80% of the commuters in the Bay Area commute by their private automobile. Only 11% of the commuters in the Bay Area use public transit. And I want to point out that over the years, we've spent hundreds of millions and millions of dollars into public transit. But that portion of the commuting community that, that commutes by public transit really hasn't changed significantly in years and years and years. We think the focus on transit in Reg Regional Measure 3 misses the main problem. The basic problem is that given the cost of living and the price of real estate, it's increasingly difficult for people to be able to afford to buy a home near where they work. So they're forced to commute. And, and we think, we think it's, it's gross. And, and keep in mind, too, that many of these people who commute across the bridge, they're doing it because they have to. It's a function of being able to get to work and, and provide for their families. Many of these workers are low-income workers. They're not high-tech folks. They're, they're service people and whatnot. And to increase their commute costs 
from $5 to $8, or in the case of the Bay Bridge at commute time, from $6 to $9 a day is a significant impact on them. We think the answer really lies in shifting our emphasis from trying to bolster public transit to those kinds of economic development policies that will encourage the jobs to be created where the people live. And in East Bay and North Bay, we, we have ample opportunity for that kind of economic development so that fewer people are forced to commute to work by whatever means. Well, one of the issues with this measure, one of the things it provides for is I think most of the money or the biggest chunk of money goes towards new BART cars. Now, I'm not sure if you commute on BART, but I've taken BART quite a bit. And I know that if you get on BART at Pittsburgh Bay Point, by the time you get to Concord, there are no more seats. So you're standing up from Concord all the way into San Francisco. So I don't see what's wrong with getting more BART cars, getting more BART service, which would probably get some of those people off of the, off of the, off of the freeways. Well, two things. Number one, um, I don't think there's any question, but uh, BART needs to update its system. It is antiquated. Many of the existing cars and the train control system are obsolete. And, and so in order to be able to expand BART capacity, you have to change the train control system and you have to bring in new cars. And, and that, seems, that seems reasonable. However, BART already receives an enormous amount of money. And I'll give you, a, and, and they don't use it very wisely in all cases. I'll give you an example. Some years back, we agreed to allow BART to increase its fares, but we required that BART set aside a certain portion of that increased revenue into a fund to help pay capital expansion costs. It's, it's $800 million or more currently. The BART board has repeatedly refused to commit to use that money for capital purposes. When we asked them, why, why, don't you, why don't you use the money the way it was intended? We, we need the flexibility to use that money any way we see fit, which, which in our mind means it's very likely to wind up going into compensation or something like that, rather than going into capital acquisitions for a new train control system or new cars. The other, the other thing I want to point out about BART is, in addition to local and state money, BART receives quite a bit of money from the federal government as well. From the taxpayer's perspective, you have to look at all of the revenue they receive and where it's, where it's coming from. So, we, so we're, uh, we're not optimistic about, uh, about the way this measure provides even more money uh, for BART. And again, remember, there are no measurable goals associated with this project. We're essentially giving these agencies money, and they can do pretty much whatever they want, and w we have no way of knowing. You know, when, when are you actually going to accomplish any of this stuff so that we can hold them accountable? You, you mentioned that uh, Danville uh, has been paying f BART taxes uh, for, I think they started in the 50s. 59, um, I think, yeah. 59 um, you know, Contra Costa, Antioch, Pittsburgh, those folks have been paying taxes too. In fact, I bought a house in Antioch in 1995, and at the time I was told, you better buy now, or cause when BART gets here in a few years, prices are going to go way up. It's 1995, and now we're going to get eBART uh, like next month. So what's to say if, if this measure passes that the money is going to go where it's supposed to go to get BART to San Jose? Well, that's a great question, but, but here's the good answer. The fact is there is guarantees in this. Um, one of the things I think all of us, um, and Senator Steve Glazer really gets the credit for it, um, he's always asked BART to have oversight and to have some accountability. In this measure, this actually puts an inspector general, which the governor gets to appoint, um, and can't be removed without the governor doing that. And I think that's something to address Jack's concern um, that we've all been looking for. In fact, uh, Jack's group was one of the proponents of uh, any money going to BART would do that. The second, second thing is there is an oversight board um, for this. Each county um, through the Board of Supervisors puts two people on there um, to help oversee that above and beyond all the other transportation agencies. Um, but I think with what you see for BART, BART's capacity is not just new cars because they need new cars from a technical. Each car holds more people. So the capacity, the fact is that they can respond to a new software system. The cars will be able to move um, closer, faster, and get more people on the system. Because as you said, Bob, it's at capacity. There's no question. But here's a test for what capacity means, too. It's called the Columbus Day effect. So you all remember on Columbus Day, um, it's that one day of the year, about 10 to 11% of the population has that day off. 
and traffic in the Bay Area moves smoother than it ever does. That's the estimates that you get. So when you're looking at a finite system, we've got a couple of extensions, but we have as much pavement as I think we can get out there, so we have to figure out ways to do it efficiently. So even if we can get 3% more on BART, we can get a little more on ferries, a little more on buses, when you add that up, and then using smart te technology like what this measure will get for us on 680, that gets us to the Columbus Day effect. And then other issues that are outside of transportation, where should houses be and things like that, that's a discussion in and of itself. But relative to transportation, we have to fix it. This is a well thought out plan. It doesn't sell solve everything. But I think that this is something that we should support and I feel really confident after 23 years in government this is one I know what I'm going to do. Our agency, Contra Costa Transportation Authority, will have over $700 million. Our projects are on time and under budget, and we are accountable. The Call to Cut Tunnel, one of the first big projects I worked on, on time and under budget. And you know what? We can do this, and I think we have a great opportunity. You know, but it's not just the transportation agency that's the issue. I mean, you have cities which are approving housing. Uh, Martinez, we talked about that. Um, uh, where I live in Antioch, we're talking about adding a couple of thousand more homes. I mean, cities are building homes further away from the, 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 the job centers, San Francisco, Oakland, Silicon Valley. So how will this measure, you know, balance, you know, the development with the transportation priorities? Well, I think housing, housing is a complicated, as, I, I, as professionally, I work in housing and do housing in San Francisco. But one of the things that you look at is people are building in places that there's land available. So where you live, there's lots of land in Danville. Our population in the past 18 years increased just a little over 90 people a year. And really in the past few years, probably 30 and 40 because our master plan were built out. Some cities has opportunities. San Francisco has added 10,000 housing units, right? So that's live work. One of the things that technology is just finally getting up to is that you're seeing where people don't have to go to work every day in the same traditional sense. And we always thought that would happen back in the 90s. But it didn't because technology wasn't there. Now, um, you'll see companies that do virtual employees and you're seeing more of that. But that, that's a few years away before that's going to happen. But in, but in housing, transportation is its own problem. For a hundred and something years, we've been trying to get people to San Francisco. We used to have a, a robust ferry system. We used to have a robust train system. And you know what? Somewhere along the line, General Motors and some of those other companies bought those systems up here in Southern California, Northern California, they're gone. We're trying to recreate those. Unlike the East Coast, they still have traffic problems. But I tell you what, with this concept in place to get us back to what I call that Columbus Day effect, the housing is getting, there are new standards that are coming out. There were 15 new state legislative bills that came out that's going to change the course of how cities build housing and the way they do it. You know, Mr. Ware, you talked about how adding $3 to the toll, so that's $15 a week for somebody that's, that's commuting into San Francisco. Um, I've traveled around the country, and I don't know if anybody here has ever been to New York, but to get through the Midtown Tunnel now is like 8 to $10. So we're actually, maybe we've gotten a pretty good deal up until now uh, on our bridges, and to add a dollar every three years is not that, not that big of a deal. Uh, what's wrong with that? I guess you'd have to ask the working family that has to pay that. I don't think they care very much about the difference between what they have to pay and what you might have to pay in, uh, in New York. Their, their interest is much more locally focused, you know, trying to meet the high cost of living, uh, including the highest tax burden of any state in the country. And if I may, I want to pick up on something that Newell mentioned. Um, it's interesting, this project, this proposal requires that there be an inspector general appointed to, to uh, look into BART. But it seems completely inappropriate and unfair to me that people forced to cross the bridge to get to work should pay the costs associated with BART's inspector general. BART gets plenty of money. I, I don't see any reason why BART itself shouldn't have to pay for its own inspector general. Well, I mean, the, the measure calls for a committee to be set up, like an oversight committee which will have the Inspector General. Am, am I correct on that? Well, there'll be an Inspector oh, no. General for BART no. and an Oversight Committee for the whole right. no, um, no, the, measure. The, the proposal, I believe, says okay. that the, that a million dollars will be used out of these increased toll funds to pay for the BART Inspector General. We, we just think that's That's complete. a pretty good job. 
I think I might apply for that. Well, it's a million dollars <laughs> over the period, but also think about it. You also want that to be independent. That's a key word. So you don't want to rely on the BART to have direct funding for that. If you're going to do a true oversight, make sure that there's money and funds set aside so and truly. I mean, Jack brings a good point, but in fact, the reason that it's set aside um, is so that it does have independence. Do you think, do you think that committee will actually be independent? No, I don't. I have, uh, I have over 10 years' experience on school bond oversight committees, and I'm a former director of the California League of Bond Oversight Committees. And, and Contra Costa Taxpayers, incidentally, has, has furnished a member of the BART Oversight Committee that, was, that, that uh, came into being when they passed their last tax measure. It's very difficult for, for uh, oversight committees to be truly independent unless they're given to understand right from the outset, your job is not to help the organization you're overseeing do its job. Your job is to make sure the money is being spent in the way the voters were promised. And it sounds simple in concept, but, but in, in, uh, in, in, in the real world, it's, it's, it's difficult. I think that there is a need for an oversight committee. I would like to see membership on that co committee that's something other than representatives appointed by uh, the, the various counties. I, I'd like to see representatives from the senior community and from the business community and from the taxpayer uh, advocacy community and, and whatnot. So the point is, I th we certainly need a better transportation system, and we certainly need a, a really good plan to implement that transportation system. I don't think this plan does that for us. I, I, think, we should, I think we should turn this down and go back to the sponsors and say, put together something that's really reasonable, really rational, with specific goals and timelines and, and, and that kind of thing, and, and, uh, and, and take another shot at it, frankly. So you would like to see this voted down. If Absolutely. it is voted down, where do we go? Well, we're right back where we started. We're talking about you can't talk the problem to death. If you, Traffic is real. It's, it's empirical. There's vehicles, cars, all trying to converge to go to similar destinations. We can't keep talking about it. We have to take the steps necessary to improve that. And again, um, we're sort of agreeing here that, yeah, there is. I just disagree that there is, and I'm, I'm speaking mainly for Contra Costa County, and I know it's in the other plans. I know Alameda County. I know how well they manage their plans. These are real projects. These are projects that we've had on the books, but there has not been the funding source. So we talked about them, and we planned it. We have shovel ready. We have great oversight. We've never had oversight in the past. So all the things that have been asked for are here. Legislatively, this is the only legal option that we have in order to raise money to fix traffic. Without this, there are no other solutions. So if you want to um, improve traffic, will we improve everything? No. Will we make it better? Absolutely. Can we get closer to that Columbus Day effect? Yes, if we carry out all of these things. And, and the fact is, is that we are making a nexus to the people who are causing the problems. And it's not fair to blame, well, my job is over there. Well, God, I'm going to that job because I can make more money than the job over there. And that's our, we can't blame somebody for that. That's, that's our competitive drive. Yeah. So one of the things that's in there is, is the 680 Highway 4 interchange, which is pretty close to Martinez. What's not in there is 680 and, and, and 242, uh, not 680, Highway 4 and 242 is not in there in this plan. I'm assuming it'll be in a future plan. We're paying, we've raised the gas tax, we've raised car registration, um, we're always spending money. Are we ever going to have enough money to accomplish all of the things that we need to do to fix our transportation priorities? I don't know. I. Uh... I know that over the years, um, the state's contribution to public transportation infrastructure has steadily declined, and state spending on, on other things has increased significantly. Um, from a taxpayer's perspective, we're always asking the question, are you spending the money the way you said you would, and are you spending the money wisely? Uh, I, I, I'm interested in Newell's comment. Um, we built the fourth bore of the Caldecott Tunnel essentially uh, with an initiative from uh, Contra Costa Transportation Authority funded by people in Contra Costa. I don't think there's any question, but people in Contra Costa are willing to sp spend money to significantly improve things. I in my opinion, this measure really won't do that for us. I'll leave it right there. Thank you to our panel for answering some of these questions. 
Each of you now has 90 seconds to make a closing statement. And Mr. Weir. Well, I want to thank the league and uh, thank CCTV and you, Bob, uh, for uh, providing this opportunity. Uh, Contra Costa taxpayers recognizes the need. We know we need a really good comprehensive plan. We're absolutely convinced this measure is not the plan that will get us where we need to be, and, and it won't spend the money the way uh, taxpayers should be able to rely on the money being spent. So we urge voters to reject re Regional Measure 3. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, Bob, thank you, and uh, Jack, really nice to see you again. Appreciate the con conversation, and this is a wonderful way to, to discuss issues um, thoughtfully um, and with some real um, passion to this. I want to leave you that are watching at home that, that in Contra Costa County, we have, we have sought out to make sure that the monies that we pay, that we get our fair share back for this. And I tell you, with, with Contra Costa Transportation Authority, our track record, as uh, Mr. Weir has pointed out, that we do our promises, we do it on time, and we do it under budget. That we do have a lot that is in it for Contra Costa County specifically, but when you look back at the history, vehicle license fees are still a fraction of what they were 16 years ago. And that's what's got us into part of this mess, is that the funding, as Jack has said, is dropped off. We're trying to restore some of that. These are carefully thought out solutions with great oversight and accountability. I hope you'll join me and my fellow elected officials and others in voting for Regional Measure 3 in June to help get us out of our traffic con congestion and allow you to spend more time with your family and to enjoy life. Thank you for listening. That concludes our measure on Regional Measure 3, our form on Regional Measure 3. For more information on this measure and all the candidates and everything on the June 5th ballot, visit the website votersedge.org. And to view this broadcast online, go to www.cocovote.us. I'm Bob Butler. Thank you for watching. And please don't forget, you got to get out and vote on June 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.